Thank you for joining us at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston for today's online worship service. I'm Marilyn Knight. I'm John Hyatt. And we're members of the church. Fire has been imagined as a sacred element for as long as there has been religion. We are reminded of this as we light the second candle of our Advent candle. Dr. Boston kicks off our monthly theme of fire with a sermon titled, Stirring the Embers. He will help us look at what we can do to bring back a connection to the sacred element fire during this most challenging time. Dr. Boston is joined by First Church Assistant Minister of Congregational Life, the Reverend D. Scott Cooper, Alex Kamen, Family Minister Coordinator, and Carol Burris, Director of Religious Community. The worship associate this morning is Leslie Morrison, and the Ramirez family is lighting the chalice. Music director Mark Vogel is joined by pianist Terahuko Toda and Charlie Burris on guitar. Some of you may be new to the congregation or online services, so let us say a few words about Unitarian Universalism. Unitarian Universalism is a faith where you can bring your whole self your full identity, your questioning mind, your expansive heart. As Unitarian Universalists, we join together on a journey that honors everywhere we've been before. Together, we create a force more powerful than one person or one belief system. Our beliefs are diverse and inclusive. Rather than a creed, we share a covenant based on a set of seven principles. These include the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and the knowledge that we are part of an interconnected web of all existence that calls us to honor the earth and all creatures. We now invite you to hear our call to worship. We gather together this morning during a period of waiting. We gather in community and light the chalice and light the second of the Advent candles. The term Advent was adopted from the Latin Adventus, meaning coming or arrival. More recently, in addition to honoring the traditional observance of Advent, we have acknowledged our own waiting for the lengthening of daylight hours and the arrival of renewed hope as symbolized by the birth of a baby. This year, we look forward to a vaccine and a spring when, just perhaps, there's a return to not just some sense of normalcy, but to a kinder and wiser world. We gather together this morning during a period of waiting. We wait together in community, and we gather in love. Come. Let us worship together. We are Unitarian Universalists with minds that think, hearts that love, and hands that are ready to serve. Celebremos compartiendo nuestras vidas, encendiendo esta luz. We light an Advent wreath to mark both the days approaching the solstice and the advent of Christmas. Inspired by the neo-pagan tradition, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we lit a candle in the south, honoring the element of fire. Fire burns away the old and creates space for the new. We kindle that flame again this morning. Today, we light a candle in the east, a candle for air. Air gives the gift of spirit. Spirit comes from the Latin spiritus, the intake of breath. Our spirits are us, we are our spirits, our spirits are our breaths. Without air, we are not. Blessed be.
year. Make your house fair as you are able. Trim the hearth and set the table. People look east and sing to taste. Love the guest is on the way. Furrows be glad though earth is bare. One more seed is planted there. Give up your strength, the seed to nourish, that in course the flower may flourish. People look east and sing to gaze, love the roses on the way. Stars keep the watch when night is dim, one more light the bowl shall brim, shining beyond the frosty weather, bright as sun and moon together. People look east and sing today, love the star is on the Have you ever watched a candle burn? It's like the fire is alive. It flickers. It dances in the wind. It changes with every breath. It's like it's alive. It's born and then it burns and then it dies. Fire is special. People have always known that fire was special. Long, long ago, before people made matches or candles, they looked up in the sky and saw that big ball of fire, the sun, brought warmth to the earth and brought back light after the night. They knew it was special. And they made their own fires that cooked their food and kept them warm and brought them light. People honored fire. Fire was power. It can create and it can destroy. It can bring light and it can burn. Fire is wonderful, but also fire can be terrible. People have long thought that fire was something sacred and holy. Some people even worshiped fire and said that it was a deity, like a goddess or a god. No matter what specific things people believed, people all over the world have given a special place in their religions to fire. Some had sacred fires in, the, in their temples. Some set sacred lamps on their altars. Some lit sacred bonfires on the hilltops and in the groves. They placed sacred torches near the graves of those who died. We still hold fire sacred today. In Washington, D.C., near the tomb of the unknown soldier, burns an eternal flame, one that never goes out. And in many faiths today, fire is sacred. In churches at Christmas time, many Christians light four candles on the Advent wreath. In Sweden, people celebrate the day of St. Lucia with crowns of candles, honoring the giving of food to the hungry. During the eight days of Hanukkah, Jewish people light the eight candles on the menorah. And in Diwali, Hindus set out small lamps all around their homes. And when Unitarian Universalists gather, we light a chalice. This is our sacred fire the flame that gives light and warmth, just like all fires. It's also a symbol representing many aspects of our faith, including the light of learning, learning about other faiths, learning how to be our best selves, exploring our ideas, and ways to change the world to make it a better place for all. This chalice lights our way. Today, we honor all the festivals of light 
around the whole world, reminding us that differences are to be celebrated and that together our light shines bright. Please join me in what some call prayer and others name meditation. Find your center. Imagine the spark within, the flickering flame, your spirit, the thing that is you, that makes heat and transforms matter into energy. The flickering flame. Fire has been sacred as long as there has been a humanity. Fire connects us to the most ancient, to the stars that formed us, and to the oldest hearths around which the first of us gathered. Let us envision the blazing candle, the heat of wax or the burning log. The flame might die down, but it can be rekindled. Another log can be added, another candle lit. I invite you to think of your spirit that way. In these difficult times, no matter how low your flame might get, it can be rekindled, it can blaze again. Remember, the flame can always be rekindled. This Sunday, in December, as the nights get long, and in having this recollection, let your own sacred fire within burn a little bit more strongly. Let the congregation absent in body, but present in spirit, say Amen. Pause now together to lift up that which sits heavy and light on our hearts. Please say the name or bring to mind those you wish to be held by the loving embrace of this religious community. In this great cloud of witness and memory, amid this beloved community, we hear these names and hold them in our hearts. We pause in awe and wonder of the mystery that is life. In the spirit of love, in the spirit of hope, and in the spirit of compassion, I invite each of you to enter into a time of silent prayer, meditation, or reflection. This morning, we continue our tradition of Inspiration Sunday. Each year, the ministers on behalf of the staff let you know how you inspire us with your devotion to our church, to our communities, to social justice, and in deepening your spirituality. In turn, we hope to inspire you to show your appreciation for this church and the work you help and inspire us to do. This year, your support is more vital than ever. The pandemic necessitated that we shift to quality online programming. We were compelled to increase the AV technician's hours as he began the expanded and needed role of AV producer. 
At the same time, we lost significant rental income and experienced major unanticipated building maintenance costs. The number of people we have reached through our online services, Zoom classes, workshops and discussion groups, and through our social media number in the thousands. All this while continuing our community projects and social justice work, including a wildly successful Get Out the Vote initiative. We know many of you have also been financially affected by the pandemic. Today, we hope you are inspired to look with hope toward the day this is all behind us. For those of you who are able, we hope you are inspired to make a financial contribution so our congregation can continue to make a difference in the lives and of our members and in our communities. Help us to continue to spread Unitarian Universalism's message of radical love, reason, and justice. An offering will now be gratefully received. Leviticus chapter 6, verses 2b through 6. This is the ritual of the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain where it is burned upon the altar all night until morning, while the fire on the altar is kept going on it. The priest shall dress in linen raiment, with linen breeches next to his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. He shall then take off his vestments and put on other vestments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning not to go out. Every morning the priest shall feed wood to it and turn into smoke the fat parts of the offerings of well-being. A perpetual fire shall be kept burning on the altar not to go out. Firelight by Polly Chase Outdoor the winter winds rise higher, there's fury in the storm. Come warm your hands before the fire I build to keep me warm. Come help me feed the tiny spark, it's all the warmth I know. Outside there's nothing but the dark and piled drifts of snow. When firelight glow fades from my face, leave me, I shall not mind. As the last ember falls, I'll trace your shadow on the blind. Our theme this month is fire. It concludes our four month cycle of the ancient Greek elements, water, earth, air, and fire. It's been our hope that by invoking these metaphorical elements, we might help you center yourselves during this time of isolation and disconnection. No matter how far apart we are, the elements connect us each to the other those who have gone before, and those who will come after. The water cycle links me to you and to the vast ocean, the great lakes, the rivers, and the gathering storm clouds. Water flows through my veins, 
just as it courses down rocky mountain slopes. You and I are residents upon the same earth. We come from it, we return to it, we spend some time on it in between. Terrestrial beings comprised of the celestial dust of long extinguished stars. We, star children, take in breath, exhale breath, and share the fragile air of our planet. This blue marble, oxygen-rich, gives us spirit, a word derived from the Latin spiritus, to breathe. Our breaths are our spirits. The air that moves through us is us. When breathing stops, so do we. The air I breathe now may sometime travel through you. It links me to the great forests of the world, gnarled live oak, an expansive aquatic undulating kelp. We, nodes in the water cycle, residents upon earth, creatures animated by a common spirit, have come to our final element, fire. Fire is perhaps the oldest symbol for the divine. God appears as fire in many scriptures. In the Hebrew Bible, God is both the burning bush and a pillar of fire. God consumes through the temple fire, a fire that the ancient priests were enjoined to never let burn out. This tradition is by no means unique to the ancient people of Israel. Zoroastrian is among the world's oldest religions, and tending to temple fires is one of its core practices. There is a Zoroastrian holy place in India where a sacred flame has burned continuously over a thousand years. This practice could also be found in ancient Rome where the sacred fire of Vesta burned for almost that long before it was extinguished by a Christian emperor. Many of the winter holidays can be understood as days of sacred fire. Throughout Hanukkah, the menorah is lit and the candles burn, a reminder of a miracle wrought by the divine. There are advent wreaths, Christmas lights, and Yule logs. They're kindling a form of keeping watch for the turning of the year, or the arrival of the holy, or even the eternal reign of peace. So keep the log ablaze, but hearken while you wait. Soft falls the step of peace amid the bombs of hate, enjoined the poet Marion Wren. Keep the blogs ablaze, but hearken while you wait. It's good advice for these times. We are in a time of waiting. We wait not just for the turning of the year, the lengthening of the days, the advent of Christmas, or the new year. We wait for an end to the pandemic. Finally, it appears. Not now, not immediately, but in time that can be soon imagined. Multiple vaccines have been developed. One is being deployed in the United Kingdom. Others will soon be distributed in the United States. The wait will be short for some. Medical professionals are supposed to start receiving it before the end of the years and longer for others. Healthy adults who are not elders are supposed to be last in line to receive it. So whether the wait is going to be short for you or long for you, we will still all be waiting several more months before life returns to something like it was during the before times. There is still much difficulty ahead. More months of physical distancing, mask wearing, and isolation. Months of fear and months of feeling overwhelmed. Knowing this makes waiting challenging. I do not know about you, but I found 2020 to be by turns tumultuous and terrifying. The losses have been numbing, unreal. On Friday alone, more than 2,500 people died from the novel coronavirus in the United States. That is almost as many people died on September 11, 2001. To date, the virus has claimed at least 280,000 lives in this country. By the end of this coming week, more people will have died in the United States from the novel coronavirus 
than, than American soldiers died during World War II. Against the steady background of death, there has been economic calamity, disruption, and political vitriol. Some commentators have gone as far as claiming that the recent presidential election was so traumatic that it constituted a near-death experience. The rich have gotten much, much richer, while many families struggle to remain in their homes, get enough to eat, and stay safe while the pandemic ranges. Here in Greg Abbott's Texas, the political class does little, little to address these calamities. Nationally, the do-nothing Senate, managed by the obstinate Republican majority leader Mitch McConnell, is refusing to pass an aid bill that will provide direct relief to the majority of families or provide funding to struggling state and local governments. Now, I do not know about you, but I have found all of this more than a little exhausting. Between single parenting, my son's online schooling, the strange adjustments we've had to make to congregational life, and well, everything, I find myself exceptionally eager to see the backside of 2020, welcome the new year, get vaccinated, and return to a life that in some way resembles life before the pandemic. I'm sure you know what I mean. A life where going out to a restaurant did not involve a potentially lethal encounter. A life that does not require regular mask wearing. A life in which getting on an airplane is not a gamble. A life that includes indoor dinner parties, trips to the theater, in-person schooling, choir concerts, and well, something like the life that was. We are not there yet. And if you or I am going to get there, then we are going to need to continue to take precautions for some time to come. During this difficult period of waiting, we have arrived, as certain as the earth continues its dance around the sun, at the winter holidays. Well, actually, we've arrived at the period right before the winter holidays. This is the Sunday before the start of Hanukkah, we are two and a half weeks prior to the solstice, three weeks preceding Christmas, and four weeks ahead of New Year's. We are in a time of Advent within a period of Advent. We wait for the holidays to truly commence. We wait for the vaccine. During such a period of protracted waiting, it can be difficult to tend to the sacred fire of our connection to the divine or to each other. That is, I suspect, especially true now. The holidays this year will be unlike any other holidays that we have known. Most of us will stay close to home or gather with either members of our immediate household or just a small handful of others. It's a good time to think about fire. December is the month when the light is the lowest. It is, even, it is when, even here in Texas, we are most likely to need fire in our lives. Personally, I found myself burning a lot of candles, wicks fueled by wax sputtering in my apartment as the nights grow ever longer. Fire can warm us. Fire can cheer us. Fire reminds us of the sacred. The divine has been imagined as consuming flesh through flame. The divine has been thought to purify with a blaze. Fire, like our connection with the divine, needs to be nurtured needs to be maintained if it is to continue. This is a helpful lesson to remember during these difficult days, for it prompts the question, in these times when it can feel like the flames of our spirits flag, what shall we do to maintain them? And that question should come with a reminder, maintaining the fire of our connection to the divine, the flame of our spirits is not something that happens on its own. It is something that requires effort. Anyone who's built a fire will probably know this. I've lit numerous ones in my life. Fires in fireplaces, well shielded by the hearth. Fires under the pinpricked stellar dark. Fires fogged by a drizzling gray. Fires on sand, banked by rock or captivated by clay. 
If you have ever stoked a fire, you know that it probably has two easy destinies. A fire can either smolder out when it consumes all of its fuel, or more rarely, it can escape its bounds and blaze uncontrollably. Far more difficult is the maintenance of the fire so that it consumes evenly, offers a single signal throughout the night, or warms the hearth against the cold. I suspect that the ancient priests in Leviticus and the pre-Christian Romans sought to maintain their fires indefinitely because they understood that controlling fires is one of the things that makes us human. No other living species lights and man then manages fire. The naturalist Lorian Isley once made this point, writing about the moment when our ancestors lit the fires that made them human. In Greek mythology, fire is a gift stolen from the gods by Prometheus and given to us so that we might create civilization. This act placed humanity a little too close to the divine for the Roman and Greek gods, and so for it, Prometheus was punished with eternal torment. But humanity retained fire. That retention allowed us to shape metal, transmute iron and coal into steel, cook our food, dye our clothes, power internal combustion engines. It did not make us gods, but it did give us unprecedented power. Power that the climate emergency suggests we have often used unwisely to shape planetary life. The sacred fire of the Zoroastrians is understood to have burned eternally. And the fire of human culture has burned in much the same way. This fire or that fire might, be, might die, but fire itself has always been rekindled. Like fire, our connection to the divine, to the spirit that sustains us, needs to be maintained. Sometimes it is in danger of going out. And sometimes it must be rekindled. I titled this sermon, Stirring the Embers, because I suspect that this is a time when many of the fires of our inner spirits burn low, have maybe even been reduced to the barest glowing coal under a collapsing pile of charcoal and ash. And I titled the sermon, Stirring the Embers, as a reminder that like fire, our lives can be brought back to a blaze as long as some small cinder remains. That is where I find myself now, at the start of the winter holidays, in these times, in the midst of one advent, waiting for the turning of the year, caught in another, hoping for the distribution of a vaccine. What about you? How brightly does your sacred fire blaze? What are you doing to maintain it, to stoke it? How might you nurture it during this time of advent? For my part, I found some comfort, some connection, through maintaining some traditions and letting go of others. I've made eggnog and set up an advent calendar. When Hanukkah arrives, my son and I will kindle the menorah and fry latkes. At the same time, in general, I find myself taking something of a conservative turn. The philosopher Michael Oakeshott claimed that conservatism was best understood as a disposition it is to prefer the familiar to the unknown, to prefer the tried to the untried, fact to mystery, the actual to the possible, the limited to the unbounded, the near to the distant, the sufficient to the superabundant, the convenient to the perfect, present laughter to utopian bliss. Now, Oakeshott's formulation is problematic when applied to the political, and he appears to unnecessarily create existential distinction between savoring the present and preparing for the future. Nonetheless, I find myself trying to blow upon the embers of my own spirit and turning to the parts of the familiar that I can discover as still obtainable within the present disruption. I spend as much time visiting the classics as reading new ones, new, as reading new texts. The well-worn wards of Dostoevsky, Sappho, or James Baldwin are offering me as much wisdom as I, that I find in the works of thoughtful contemporaries. My palate seems to have contracted too. Favorite foods from childhood spent, a childhood spent partially in England beckoned me far more than innovation. 
Oh, the puddings I have made. And yet, here too, I find myself longing more for the familiar than the novel. A preference for Lyle's golden syrup in treacle pudding over the southern standard of Steen's pure cane syrup. Have you found the same to be true? That in this time of uncertainties, there is comfort in the certain? I cannot tell you how to stir your spiritual embers in these times. You might find it best to resort to the firelight, as the poet Polly Chase did her during her own period of waiting. For her, the flame became an aid to memory, the dying of fire an opportunity to linger. When the firelight glow fades from my face, leave me, I shall not mind. As the last ember falls, I'll trace your shadow on the blind. You may discover it in the familiar, in the routine, my greatest source of internal stability during this epoch of illness has been my regular spiritual practice. No matter the funk I feel, and the funk I feel I fear is often not Clintonian, I have found that processing the calamitous world around me through my journal is a consistent source of calm. You might find it in the novel in pursuing a new way of being, but either way I can only encourage you like this, Stir your ember, kindle your flame, for we are in a waiting time, a time of Advent. The days might be difficult, the hours dour, but lo, on the horizon, the turning of the year, the ending of the pandemic. It might not be here today or tomorrow, but it will arrive. And when it does, and when it does, Oh, glorious day when the fires of our spirits shall blaze again. Until then, my friends, absent in body but present in spirit, I offer you this Advent prayer. O oh, spirit of life, that we might imagine as the sacred flame that burns eternal, the spark within each of us, or call the force of human culture that transmutes matter, harnesses energy, plows fields, plants seeds, and develops vaccines, stir within each of us a little stronger every day as we, making our way through these times, learn as best we can how to nurture the embers of our spirits when they burn low and trust that someday soon this time of turmoil will end and we will begin to gather again. That it might be so, encouraging you to wear a mask, to keep your social distance, and do what you can to sustain yourself, I invite the congregation to say, Amen. Not love my 
my words are vain A sounding brass and hopeless gain Though I may give all I possess And striving so my love profess But not be We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As we end our time of worship, let us be conscious of the flickering flame within each of us and the unfolding beauty around us. Peace to you, love to you, and the tidings of the season to you. Amen and blessed be. While our church as buildings is closed, our church as people is still meeting, but now online. There are weekly and monthly offerings to keep you connected and engaged with our community. Join us this morning at 11.30 for the Coffee Half Hour. Grab your favorite mug and log in to interact with new and old friends. The Creative Writing Group meets today at 2. The group nurtures the creation of new work, provides in-depth discussions of each work, and fosters insights into the creative process. The Women's Book Club will meet Monday at 7 to discuss Carnegie's Maid by Marie Benedict. And Dr. Bosson's Text for Troubled Times meets Tuesday at 5 to discuss Gravity and Grace by Simone Weil. Come to the Membership 101 Thursday at 6 to find out about joining the church or attend the second Thursday discussion group at 6.30. They'll discuss the opportunities and possibilities presented by the multiple crises of our times. Many of the topics for upcoming discussion groups are on our website, firsttou.org forward slash online hyphen group hyphen meetings. Visit there for more details and to sign up. And remember, all time shown are Central Standard Time. Mm-hmm.